Hi there, welcome to episode three of Ask Paul Kirtley. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about ticks. We're gonna be talking about starting kids off with bushcraft. We're gonna be talking about alternative tinders. We're gonna be talking about friction fire lighting woods. And we're gonna be talking about techniques for getting a bit closer to wildlife. This episode of Ask Paul Kirtley comes to you from the Lake District in the northwest of England. We're here running an expedition canoeing skills course. Myself and Ray Goodwin are leading the course. It's the first day and Ray's out on the lake getting the students up to speed with their basic paddling skills. So while he does that, I'm taking the opportunity to answer some of your questions for Ask Paul Kirtley. All right, first question. Tim asks, my lad is five and comes camping with me, but what is a good age to start teaching kids bushcraft and where to start? Okay, Tim, that's a, that's a really good question. It's a sensible question. Um, love the picture you sent on Instagram. More of that from people if you can. Um, take a photograph. You can put text in the photograph or underneath, tag it, ask Paul Kirtley. That's a really nice visual way of asking a question and Tim's done a great job there, um, really liked that. So um, I think kids are old enough to start bushcraft when they're really old enough to start going camping or even when they're old enough to, to go outside. You can get them interested in nature from a young age. And you know, kids are closer to the ground. I know it's an obvious thing to say, but they're very inquisitive and they see a lot of things that as adults we don't see because we're further away from them and because we live in our adult world where we're thinking about shopping and what's for dinner and you know, we're more distracted and they're really inquisitive. They're into everything, they're interested in everything encourage that show them things show them animal tracks show them nuts that have been nibbled by squirrels show them those things get them interested because they are naturally interested so you can get them interested in nature as soon as they're as soon as they're being inquisitive and i think that's a really good way of introducing them into the world of bushcraft because at the heart of it really is a is a study of nature um, then if you're taking them camping, you're taking them out, you can start them with some of the important skills. Get them used to being around a fire. Um, get them to understand that there are hazards around a fire, but equally get them to respect it and be comfortable. Not be afraid of it, but you know, have a fire. You know, if you light a fire, next time they'll want to be involved as well. So you can start getting them involved. You can let them have a go with a fire steel or a flint and steel. You can start getting them involved in some of the things that you're doing. You can show them how to strike a match carefully and you know, always be doing things like leaving no trace of your fire so that that just becomes a normal part of the routine. Um, get them to enjoy camping out get them to enjoy being out in the dark and not being afraid of the dark. They're all great things that you can start doing with your kids from an early age. And then in terms of some of the harder skills of bushcraft, such as using cutting tools, again, I think you can start relatively early, but you just have to do it in a way that's progressive, makes them respect the tools because there are hazards. Start them off with very simple things. I remember I had a, I had a, um, a Swiss Army knife from when I was about six or seven years old. So you can start people off at an early age and you do it in a way that you know, kids know when they're misbehaving. And I remember I, I stuck my Swiss Army knife in a tree a couple of times in the garden. My dad saw me and he took it off me for a week and I wasn't allowed to use it. And so as long as you set out the boundaries very clearly and you tell them what they can and can't do and make sure they understand the basic safety issues, and that they, they look after each other if you've got more than one child so that they, they know if somebody come, comes near them, um, if they've got a younger or an older brother or sister, if somebody comes near them, if they're using a pen knife or a, or a small mora knife, that they put the knife down and wait for the other sibling to move away. And in that way, you build up um, naturally their understanding of what's safe and what's not safe. So I think your lad's five, get him out, get him out in nature more, introduce him to nature, introduce him to fire lighting, introduce him progressively through using cut, cutting tools that will need close supervision to start off with. But over time, he'll be able to pick it up and do things safely without you needing to worry about it. And that's exactly what you want. So great question, Tim. Let us know how you get on. Send us some more photos on Instagram. Thank you. Next question. Darren asks, 
Paul, what are your favourite UK woods for both the hand drill and bow drill? Okay, good question, Darren. And I keep saying they're good questions. Of course they're good questions. I've selected them as good questions. So, but there's loads of good questions coming in. And I will say some of the questions coming in by email are a little bit long. They're not really one question. They're sort of multiple questions in a paragraph. If you can just send one key question in, then we can keep the show relatively short. I'm trying to keep this five questions in under 15 minutes. That's what I'm trying to do here. So if we can keep the question short, I can give more of an answer and keep it more concise for people. So Twitter and Instagram are great. Remember to use the hashtag Ask Paul Kirtley so I can find them. If you're going to send one via the speak pipe on my blog, that's great. Keep the message under a minute. Or if you're going to send me an email, keep it quite short, one or two sentences, and then we can get through the questions more rapidly. I'm going to try and make more of these, but um, keeping the questions concise really helps. So Darren's question about um, using different woods for bow drill and hand drill in the UK. Bow drill, when I teach bow drill, I tend to use willow or alder. Not because they're necessarily the easiest woods in the world to use, but because they are common and widespread and you're going to find them. Um, it's all well and good teaching people to use ivy or introduced species like red cedar, but you're not going to find them in the UK. So my favourite ones, from a practical purpose, are the ones I'm going to find when I need them. And to me, the top of that list are willow and alder. Also in parts of the country where there's lots of sycamore, sycamore's good as well. So those are the ones that I'd be concentrating on. Um, if you've got lime, lime's really beautiful wood to use for, for friction fire lighting, but you don't come across it everywhere. So focus in on the ones that you're most likely to find first. Um, willow, just make sure it's not too hard. Check um, the article on my blog for troubleshooting with your bow drill. I'll put a link to it in the show notes on my, um, on my blog. Uh, alder, sycamore, try those. If you've got access to lime, have a go with that as well, and then you can progress from there. With the hand drill, for the drill, out and out favourite is going to be elder. You can make really super drills with elder. Um, you can get them really nice and straight using heat and get a really, really good straight top quality hand drill from that. Um, in terms of a hearthwood that goes with that, um, use something like clematis or clematis, however you want to pronounce it. Um, found on chalky soils um, typically and uh, it, that's a really good, it needs to be seasoned and nice and hard um, and don't try and cut green and season it inside, it needs to be dead outside, collect that nice and solid, that's a really good combination. Going back to the bow drill woods just, just for clarification, when I'm talking about the woods to use that's for the spindle and the hearth, and use the same species for both, particularly when you're learning. Don't introduce more variables where you're using hazel on pine and all sorts of different combinations. It just makes it more difficult to get it right in, in the beginning. Just get some good quality willow, good quality alder, good quality sycamore, make the drill and the hearth on the same wood and work them together. Get to know those materials and you, you'll have success. Thanks for the question, Darren. Cheers. Next one. Next one's from Mark and he asks about ticks. Hi Paul, I hope this uh, voicemail finds you well. My name is Mark Hudson. Uh, I am a veteran Curtley student and uh, the proprietor of Country Law Bushcraft. My question is centred on ticks. Locally here in the West Country numbers appear to be on the increase year on year. Mild winters and increased deer numbers are proliferating their population. My concerns and queries are numerous, but they're really centred around public and personal safety, recommended precautions, recommended removal and bite treatment, and, as importantly, how to manage people's perception of the threat without frightening them away from our local woodlands. Hope you can help me with that. Thank you, Paul. All right, there's some... Um Good questions there, Mark, and it is a number of questions rolled up into one. Um, I'll start with the last question first, and then um, I can sort of direct you with the other ones. In terms of people's perceptions, I think you're absolutely right. I think the media in general is very good at frightening people away from nature. Um, tabloid journalism in particular is bad for this, you know, killer sharks, killer ticks, killer this, dangerous this, bears, wolves, reintroduction of this is going to kill all our dogs, all of these things, it's just bull most of it. Um, we're growing to be a society where we're frightened of nature and we certainly don't want to be adding to that. We want to be encouraging people to, to um, get out into nature, to value it, to understand it. 
and I think we need to keep things in perspective and I think you're absolutely right for raising that as, a, as an issue. Um, yes, there are uh, an increasing number of ticks. There are tick hotspots where you get more than others. Um, there are years when you get more than others depending upon the weather conditions, you know, if it's damp, if it's warm, you're going to get more ticks around potentially. And um, there are some precautions we can take and we can talk about that in a second. But equally, you've got to remember the main issue with ticks is not being bitten by the tick. The main issue with ticks is Lyme disease, which some of them carry. And um, having looked it up recently, um, it's only about 20% of ticks are thought to carry Lyme disease. So the, the odds are in your favor in that sense and that if you, even if you get bitten by a tick, it doesn't necessarily carry Lyme disease. And then if you do get bitten by a tick that has Lyme disease, you're still not necessarily gonna get Lyme disease. So we need to keep the risk in perspective. You know, we're quite happy to drive to the woods in our cars, that's much more risky than actually being in the woods itself. And so we need to keep these risks in perspective, not just in terms of us being in nature, but also in our, in our life in general. It's much more risky crossing the road than it is um, going to the woods. So let's keep it in that perspective. But in terms of people's perceptions, um, yes, there are ticks around. You will get ticks where there are healthy deer populations. You'll get ticks where there are populations of um, other animals that the ticks feed on, and that's pretty much anywhere in the woods. Um, you know, long grass, bracken, they're going to be in there. And so if you're walking through those sorts of spots where you think there are going to be ticks, make sure people have got long trousers on, make sure people are not just wearing shorts. Um, make sure that maybe they have trousers that are elasticated at the bottom to stop it's less likely that the ticks can get in there or one of the pieces of advice that some people give is putting socks tucking your trousers into your socks that said i've recently seen somebody who was doing that and they still had ticks on their ankle because the ticks went through the weave of the sock so it depends on how densely woven the socks are but basically the more clothing you've got on the less likely the ticks are going to get onto your skin so that's one thing you can do also, to discourage the ticks, you could also put insect repellent on the apertures of your clothing in particular. So you could put some DEET around the base of your trousers and that's going to discourage them from going into that area. They don't like DEET in particular. Um, and also, once you've been out, if you're in an area where um, there are ticks, I think the thing is to check regularly and check each other and don't make people be embarrassed about the fact of having a tick. I think if you've got groups in the woods, I think you just need to be open and say, look, there are ticks here, but um, it's not that massive an issue. If you get one, the important thing is that we remove it as quickly as possible. And so if you've got a tick, don't hide it, don't be embarrassed, wherever it is. Um, if you need some help removing it, come and find one of us and we will help you help you do that. I think that's the important thing. And then also explain to people how to remove them themselves. So um, make sure that they're, uh, that they're fully aware of, of what to do. And I listened to um, a, a good podcast recently where um, Mark Yates, a, follow, a fellow podcaster, um, interviewed um, uh, a lady from a charity, one of the leading charities to do with raising awareness of, of ticks and, um, and Lyme disease. And I will put a link to that in the show notes of this video, because I think that's well worth listening to. It answers a lot of the questions that you, that you have. Um, but I think in terms of managing groups in the woods, in your particular instance, make sure they're aware, put the risks in perspective, make sure they understand how to protect themselves, and make sure that they're not embarrassed to tell you, it, particularly if you've got kids, make sure they're not embarrassed to tell you um, that they've got a tick and for you to help them remove it. Um, that, that would be my advice. Good question, Mark, thank you. Anders asks, what other materials would you use for lighting the fire with the fire steel if birch wasn't available? Yeah, that's, 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 that's an interesting one, Anders, because we do get very much stuck in a rut. We have our favourite fire lighting materials that we go to, and we have our favourite combinations of fire lighting devices and materials, and then sometimes it can throw us when we go to an area, and we may be carrying our fire steel, we may be carrying a flint and steel, whatever it is that we like to use, uh, matches, cigarette lighters, whatever it is that people like to use, and we don't find the, the materials we want to light our fires with. That's part of the challenge and the fun of bushcraft in that we learn different um, materials and that we can go to any environment and have a range of different things that we can choose and use. That's, that's part of putting the different tools in our toolbox as it were, but equally we have to know what those, what those are. 
And so if you don't have birch bark, then there's a whole range of different things that you can light. And, and in fact, birch bark kind of sits in a category on its own really and it's a, it's a special one um, it, it's why it's our favorite often but there are many other things that you can light there's a there's a range of fungi if they're dry that you can light so you could light cramp balls daldinia concentrica you can light um, particularly with a modern fire flash you can light horse's hoof fungus the trammer layer of horse's hoof you can light that directly with a fire flash you don't need to do any processing like you'd have to if you're using flint and steel so there are there are certainly a few fungi around that you can light directly they will hold they will catch and hold um, an ember and then you can take that into a tinder bundle and blow that into flames um, that's one method um, some dried fibrous plant materials you can light directly the sparks are so hot from a mod modern um, Swedish fire steel that you can light um, many dried grasses particularly if you buff them up you can light them directly um, dried inner bark of um, some trees such as sweet chestnut or oak you can light those directly as long as they're fine enough and you get a big enough spark. And if you want to know how to light really big sparks with um, a fire steel, I'll put a link to the video in the show notes and the YouTube video of this, uh, of this uh, video and podcast if you're listening via the audio only. So go to my blog, paulkirtley.co.uk, in the show notes there for episode three. The links to all of the things that I mentioned that there are links to will be there for, you, for your easy access and for your convenience. So those are the things that I'll be looking at. There's some fungi, there's some fibrous plant materials, even dried grass will work very well in the right conditions. Hi Paul, I just wondered, my wife and I go walking in the woods and we go canoeing and wild camping in Scotland. Do you have any tips that will allow us to maximize our chances of seeing some of nature's wonderful wildlife? That's a great question, Mick. And um, yeah, there are some simple things that you could do. You don't need to go around clad sort of head to toe in camouflage and stalking around. Um, wearing mute colors that, are, that blend in well with the environment. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to even be the right color for some wildlife, it's just similar shade will allow you to, to blend into the environment. Um, moving quietly, um, our voice carries a hell of a long way. Humans are quite noisy, so just being quiet and moving quietly and, and pointing things out rather than shouting, oh, look what I can see, it's an obvious thing. And just being aware of the noise that we're making, um, being aware of where you're standing with your feet, um, not if you're in the woods in particular, not stepping on sticks and them cracking and making a big noise, that's important. And um, also, there are a couple of simple things that you can wear, um, such as wearing a hat with a peak that covers your face, and also, because um, that shades your face, you know, if you're walking in the woods, your face doesn't stand out as much of a beacon, and also wearing gloves if you're using binoculars in particular, looking, um, moving your binoculars around. Your hands are, again, beacons. If you can wear gloves, that'll, that'll allow those to be less visible in a distance. And use binoculars and look through the woods into an area to see if there's any wildlife. You might see a deer in, a, in a, an opening ahead. You might see its ears moving. Um, you're more likely to see that with binoculars. Look into that area look beyond where the sound is that you're casting, see what wildlife is moving around and then move quietly towards it. You're much more likely to see things that way. So there's simple tips, um, wear suitable clothing, move quietly, be aware of your voice, look through the woods and into areas where your sound hasn't traveled, use binoculars, cast shadow onto your face and wear some gloves if you're using binoculars. So I hope that helps. So that brings us to the end of episode three of Ask Paul Kirtley. Keep sending your questions in. Use the hashtag Ask Paul Kirtley. The guys and girls are back from their paddling with Ray and it's time for us to take some lunch. So catch you on the next episode. Thanks for watching and listening if you're listening to the audio. Local woodlands. Hope you can help me with that. Thank you, Paul. Okay, good. There's a lot of questions rolled. Press the stop button. Bring on black. <laughs>